Welcome to Wise Beyond Bitcoin, where you come for the crypto neo news, education, and opportunities. My name is Lucas. And my name is Ryan. And we've got a follow up on education when it comes to working in DeFi and blockchain. There's a phrase that comes up a lot in permanent loss. We've talked about it before. I see it come up on Twitter and in social media. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice for us to do a little video to address the topic again in detail? and put it out there to refer to later on, but kind of explain yeah. what a permanent loss is, what it isn't, and why I think um, you should not be worried about in permanent loss if your goal is to join, participate in the growth of blockchain in DeFi. It's, um, it's, it's a misnomer in many ways, and we'll get into that, but we've got playlists right, right here. If you're new to blockchain, new to crypto, how to start your secret crypto journey, because as you know, among the many blockchains in the IBC that we love to cover, Secret Network is definitely one of our tops due to its privacy by default layer solution um, as a smart contract right. platform. There's applications being built that you just can't find anywhere else. And we've got playlists on that too. What's being built on Secret, how to stake and, and pick your validators and what that means, airdrops and opportunities they are all around and they abound here in the IBC and other chains. So we've got the playlist. Check it out. Do your own research. This is not financial advice. Crypto education entertainment is what it is, not commercial yeah. legal advice or anything else, right? Right. Well, let's jump right in it. You know, I think a good way to start this off would be to explain what people are doing when they incur in permanent loss. And we're talking about providing liquidity. And then, so that before we talk about that, we should explain why people provide liquidity and what service that 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 provides on for these blockchains, right? And uh, so let's make that clear. So you come when to you go. Go ahead. Yeah. So let's take a look. Let's let's look at Osmosis, right? This is a AMM Dex, a um, just like you know, this is the version of Uniswap or or a Sushi Swap, but this is on the IBC. Now, what we what separates these kinds of, of protocols from Binance and, Co and Coinbase and, and the other centralized exchanges is that this is a decentralized exchange, which that means is that you're able to buy and sell without a third party using a using a community sourced liquidity, right? So when you so Coinbase, it's a corporation. They have their own. They have a balance sheet, and they they can uh, they can fill their their wallets or their or their exchange with the tokens that they need that need to be there to, to swap in and out, right? But with a DEX, with a decentralized um, version of that, it's community sourced, and liquidity is with when you're talking about exchanging and talking about buying and selling assets, liquidity is you know it's the big it's the biggie, right? You need to have there needs to be supplies of of assets to swap in and out of. There has to be currency pairs. Adam Osmo, say just take the top one. If you have some Osmo, you want to buy Atom, but if there's no Atom in the pool to buy, then you would have, then you would just not be able to make that swap. So the ability to swap on exchange on decentralized and centralized exchanges is a, ma a matter of liquidity. Mm -hmm. And with the and with decentralization, you it's about communities community sourcing that liquidity. And so the way that's done is through these liquidity pools where you where uh, an individual will have say they have they they have some osmo they have some atom and they can supply equal amounts of both of those tokens to that at autumn asmo atom osmo pool and for doing that they're contributing the res the, the tokens that people are now able to buy and sell with when they want to make a trade on that pool and for providing that service they're given a share of the fees and of the um, and of the activity that, that that pool generates, right? So so it's a fee sharing model. So there's this is how these ecosystems exist. Without this, without this uh, mechanism, this liquidity provision fee sharing mechanism, this is not possible. Decentralization, these centralized exchanges don't exist. So that's just to kind of set the groundwork for why what what role does liquidity provision play? Why would someone do this? And what benefit and, the, and what benefit does it produce for the for the network? And and it's and it's good to know that going into it. Absolutely, it's not and it's not in a vacuum. You don't just say, well, if there's a chance for permanent loss, then maybe there's no value to this, and I should never do it. It's missing the point. It's understanding that DeFi, decentralized finance, blockchain, crypto 
is built on smart contracts, removing third parties, intermediaries from serving that centralized function that you find in traditional markets and still with centralized exchanges. So here you see APRs. Here they're paid out in Osmo token. On other exchanges, they can be paid out in their native governance token, whether it's Pangolin, Uniswap, go down the list of other chains and, and their AMMs. But the point is, is that when you do provide liquidity in these pools, you earn a small portion of those fees every time an exchange is made, as well as uh, payouts in governance tokens from those chains for your support, depending upon the amount of action, the volume, incentives. the incentives that are being supported externally. Now, right. the idea that we want to share about this is two things. One, in permanent loss does not always mean loss. And two, that when you provide liquidity in these pools, let's say you're a member of IBC ecosystem and you want to add value to Juno or to Secret or to Atom or to, to, to many of them, by providing liquidity on these pools is how you help the networks grow. That is what DeFi is built on. It's built on people all over the world, not relying on a big third party to do this for them, but them pitching in together and then building out these huge $583 million pools, 208, right? And it's done by allowing in small individuals, well, small, medium, large, however big you are as an individual, but allowing individuals able to make that choice themselves and add that with the security and protection that blockchain offers your wallet, your keys. And now we're going to talk about, so let's say, okay, I want to provide liquidity and help the ecosystem grow. Should I take everything I have and put it into liquidity? Um, you know, this is not financial advice. So really it's up to you. Uh, my opinion is that you diversify and put it in different areas of the ecosystem that have different risk thresholds. Of course, as we talked about in the past, the least risky thing to do with any of these IBC proof of stake tokens is just stake a portion natively, directly right. to the validator, add that level of security to the network, earn your guaranteed inflation rewards through that network. And there you go. That's, that's about right. as simple as it gets. Now you would take a portion, 25%, 30%, 10%, whatever that is in your risk tolerance threshold that you don't mind watching go up and down more than others. And the idea when you provide liquidity, often for me, is a set it and forget it mentality. The idea is you want to put something in to help that bank of osmosis, bank of Juno swap, bank of Sienna swap, secret swap. You want to allow that to grow over time. As more people come in and more people add, you, you create these large liquidity pools that support mass adoption. So when you, you mentioned this before the video, in permanent loss, does it become permanent until you pull your money out of the liquidity pool and you, you take profit or take loss? At the end of the day, until then, they're just numbers that fluctuate right. based upon the demand at any given point in time. Exactly. Of one crypto in the pool over another, right? Well, why don't we uh, why don't we go check out that that link and and really get into the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about here because it, it's uh, it's not too complicated, but it is a little complicated. So it'd be good to get some visuals here. So let's start off with Here's what's happening. Hodl. I like the the, the hodl. <laughs> yeah. Provide liquidity. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about what happens when you provide liquidity. Um, that first paragraph kind of captures it. The, one of the big parts of it is that you're going to provide two assets, right? It's it's fifty percent of one and fifty percent of the other, and that split is important. That ratio is important. That you need it, it's going to be there's going to be it needs to be equal, right? So there you pair these two equal assets together in some ratio in some ratio so that the dollar value is equal, and you commit them uh, for some kind of uh, to a contract to a pool, and for that you get the fees and the incentives and the governance top token and and whatever whatever uh, comes out of whatever. Um, contractually has been offered for that pool, that's what you're going to receive. Now, the, where the impermanent loss comes in is, imagine something happens, say you're, you're doing, uh, you got DAI and ETH, right? And then uh, you commit the two. And now imagine ETH uh, runs up, you know, maybe there's a big 
some kind of something happens and ETH becomes more valuable, right? Well, now obviously your the the total value of your thing uh, is going to have to stay the same, right? I mean, the, not the total value, the, the the ratio between the two assets needs to stay the same. That's how these these pools work. Right. So the, the asset that appreciates, some function of that will be sold off. Some some function, some ratio, some fraction of it will be sold off, and then moved over to the one that hasn't hasn't gone up, the one that's that's flat, right? So in this case, would be die. So the point is, is that you're not losing anything. You're just getting a re uh, a reorganization or reallocation of how those assets are, are allocated or split between those two two tokens, right? So you get less of one and more of the other, but you're still at the same. Uh, they're still going to be equal to the same dollar value, right? So you're not you're not l- really losing anything. In and then when pools. you yeah. in those two pools, and then but then you got to factor in the gains in terms of incentives and fees and uh, the, the the governance tokens that you may that you may have received. So. And then when you when you zoom out, you're you're still making money, and the, the but the loss, the impermanent loss, would be if would be a, sort of an opportunity cost. So you see here clearly that uh, you could have had a, a slightly more do- more money if you had just hold those two separate tokens in your wallet, right? In this example, and that's the point is we want to stress from an from an economics background. This we find this is a great time to come out and give another explanation as to impermanent loss because it's often spoken about in this zero sum framework when in reality, impermanent loss often in crypto is not a loss. You will find in this example that when it's someone game. When started, they started with $20,000, 10,000 of each. That's how this example starts. And due to the price going up in ETH versus DAI a lot, when they rebalance and keep that portfolio, that liquidity position balance, they end up due to the increase in price of Ethereum with a little bit less Ethereum, but they end up with more die than before because that's how it works. So they still in this in this scenario went from twenty thousand to twenty thousand nine hundred seventy six. So you're seeing a twenty three dollar loss, which is really just an opportunity cost. That's all this is is saying. Oh, if I would have held instead of doing that, right, a different opportunity, right then I would have made this much more. Well, while that may be true, you will see that in both scenarios, someone has done very well and actually didn't lose anything. They actually were able to gain. So, And if if I'm reading this properly, I don't think the the, uh, fees or the the governance rewards are even included in this. So really, we're just looking at purely what the two tokens change, how the values change. But this is an incomplete picture. Is that when you come over here and there's APRs that you're getting daily payouts in Osmosis token as a reward, and you can take that token and go buy more ETH or go buy more Yes. on that network. Right. And that's the idea that's not being calculated. So the more you participate and there's rewards that come through, provide liquidity that often offsets or can actually give you a greater gain than you would have otherwise. But the other thing we wanted to mention is this. So what? So what if you could have made an extra 23 bucks or a little bit more? One thing that we would like to stress is that the value of ETH and these projects, they don't go up from everyone just sitting around holding on to their bags. Dude, as I'm as glad as you as said that because we're on the same path. We, I was going to bring up the same point. Go if ahead. Ev- if everyone said, oh, and permanent loss is a risk, so I'm just going to hold on. That's silly. It's like, well, you don't understand what's allowing the value of these ecosystems to grow in the first place, which is right. on the concept of DeFi and be your own bank. And the idea is that if you would like to see your Ethereum or your Osmosis or Juno, your smart, if you'd like to see that community, the value of it grow, then you should participate in its growth and its value. So right. it's like, maybe you take a little bit of impermanent loss, but you're also, by providing that liquidity, you're also allowing for that. You're supporting community. the network. You're supporting, allowing it to grow in value. Let me, say it, let me say it another way. It's not, this, this example really doesn't explain why ETH went up in this. It's not, it's just, it's just said, okay, ETH goes up 50 bucks, right. but ETH is going up 50 bucks because of the network effects. Inherently people, users are buying into the asset because of what they can do with it. Right. And it's useful. Well, if people weren't contributing liquidity to these pools, that wouldn't be the case. There would be no, there'd be very little demand for that asset. Right. So by 
contributing liquidity and maybe taking a little impermanent loss risk, you're actually guaranteeing or you're helping to ensure that this ecosystem has future growth, which means that the value of the assets you are holding are going to have go up with the network's growth, right? So it's a it's a bit of a way of I wouldn't I hate to use the term, but you're 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 essentially pumping your own bags. Correct. Or when you're providing liquidity. Absolutely. And so that should be that should be included in our discussion. That's it. I, that's that's one of the main points to get across is look at it in a macro, in a dynamic, in a complete view and not just isolate the idea of, oh, I could have potentially made more gains if I would have done this. Just right. look, look at the value, what causes value to grow up in these communities and understand, like you said, it's not even an impermanent loss unless you pull your liquidity out and you and you make that a reality. Right, right? make it real. So. But even then, it's still kind of a misnomer because you could sell off the excess die you've received and buy back that ETH. That's right. And and sell off your 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 fees and your uh, your your governance rewards as well. So it's you know this is a technical concern, but I think the term scares people off. But it's well named. It's well. It's aptly named in the sense it's called impermanent loss. Impermanent. So it's right there in the in the words. You know, it's not permanent. It's right there in the title of the of the of the concept. And while I'm just pulling these up because we have a video we just did recently, and you'll see it up on our channel when it comes to airdrops and opportunities. One thing we want to stress is that while you may have impermanent loss, you will often find in blockchain cryptocurrency communities that they love to say thank you to those that help grow the networks. And you will find airdrops and other gifts and often rewards that come from being a part of the growth and providing liquidity and voting and partaking in right. the network. So whether it's Osmosis, Juno Swap, Secret Swap, there are more on different shit. This is just a, a quick IBC overview on some of the larger, more preeminent right. swaps. But when you come into those liquidity pools and you provide liquidity and help support the growth, not only do you earn those fees and you earn those rewards, but you also open yourself up to airdrops and other opportunities right. down the line. Yep, that's true. That needs to be said because that would that more than compensates for these for these uh, opportunity costs. So we'll leave these links below to do your own research. And this is by no means a complete list of the AMMs and, and the DEXs that are out there, but there are more. And if you'd like to know where they are at, you know where to follow and what to check out because we've got it all right here. We'll keep you wise beyond Bitcoin because there's a lot happening in blockchain and crypto, more than we can research. So if you know about some projects right. that are some airdrops happening in the IBC, some new chains popping up, or some other stuff going on in the EVM world or other, let us know where we can do some research and break it down and share that with you guys. Until the next time, have a beautiful day. Namaste, y'all. Thank you.